<laughs> What's up, Blake? Thanks for being on uh, the show. I can't believe it's taken us long, us this long to get you on. But uh, I swear, if I was here uh, for the showdown in Miami when you were here, I would have been begging to have you on. So thank you for making some time for us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I understand things happen. <laughs> my my life's been kind of crazy right now, so I get it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I feel like um, as a lifter, you haven't gotten as much of like the recognition as I think you should have, just because you're so you're like quiet and mild mannered, and you don't like start internet beefs and like that's the ticket to, to recognition apparently in like this day and age but it's uh it's cool to see someone you know winning and out there repping for like for the good guys <laughs> so. you also don't post, yeah, I mean, post that much training either so do what it doesn't look like you post that much training compared to other people either is yeah, that by design no, I, i'm trying I'm trying, you know, oh, okay. maybe I, I've been getting like two or three posts a week now, you know, definitely a, an improvement. Right. <laughs> so it's not like, uh, I know some people, I think I remember b back in, uh, I want to say back in the day, but it was only like a couple years ago when Steffi was competing against like, uh, Mariana and Cece and, uh, Stacy, it was like, they had this like little game, I think going on of like posting things or not posting them like to mess with each other like gamesmanship yeah like yeah. like you know mariana would post something that looked really like you know like it, it moved too easy and you're like huh was that really the top set or did she put on like 50 more pounds after that and she's just gonna try uh. to surprise everybody <laughs> but, but that wasn't the tactic yeah. <laughs> i mean i used to do stuff like that when i first like got on social media and started being moderately competitive um but Instagram, social media in general, just became such a distraction in my life. And when I met my now wife, I just didn't really want any of those distractions. And so I didn't even post like three years. So wow. that didn't help. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't help with building a following, but it's probably the reason why so many people thought you sort of came out of nowhere. You know, it's like yeah. in this day and age, everyone uses everyone else as a measuring stick. And you kind of know, like going into a lot of meets where you're going to stack up and it doesn't leave a lot to like to the imagination but then you come in and everyone's just been like oh ha like hack is gonna you know take it or this person's gonna win or whatever and then yeah sneaky little blake you snuck right in there yeah. <laughs> ready with a, a hail mary deadlift every turn. <laughs> i know that was crazy i was on the edge of my seat in uh watching from home on yeah. the on the live stream but uh, that was really cool. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to jump ahead, but I definitely want to talk about the deadlift at the uh, at the showdown. The 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 iffy one. We'll talk about it. Ah. Uh, yeah. Well. <laughs> so why don't why don't we sort of pivot towards that? Because I think that um, probably a lot of people who listen to the show are, aren't familiar with you. The powerlifters obviously are, but we have an audience that goes a little bit uh, beyond that. So I'm interested. Sure. Um, the people who listen obviously will know about the hybrid showdown and the meet. Uh, you know, and that you that you won because we talked a little bit about that. But um, I want to know what your prep was like going into it, if it was different, and uh, how you th how you th or what you thought about it being a sleeves only meet this year. So kind of a three parter. Okay. Um, so you, all right. Um, so this prep actually was like pretty subpar for me like all the way around um bench was going like maybe seven out of ten in training and uh deadlift 10 out of 10 but squat like five out of ten <laughs> I, i've actually been dealing with uh some pretty bad knee pain over the past year or so and it intermittently shows up and it likes to show up when i'm in the middle of prep um <laughs> like it did this time. <laughs> and so I knew, I was hoping that 661, what I got on my third attempt was going to be in the tank. Like I was hoping that that would be there. I squatted five kilos more than that on my second attempt at my previous meet. Oh, wow. So the fact that that was an absolute grinder, you know, like shows the, the strength drop off because of what I've been dealing with. And then my bench hitting 500 on my third attempt, I, I expected to finish with like 492. I didn't expect the 500 to be there on that day. Um, 
with a and once I got and, that. And for people listening, just so they understand how insane that is, that's a 500 pound bench press, 501 at 181 pound body weight, which is ridiculous, obviously. When I still feel like I'm filling out this weight class, you know, like I'm only, I only train eight or nine pounds over. When I was a 165, I was training 15 pounds over. Wow. And that's a, and that's a, a relatively bigger cut too, just because of the percentage of body weight. That's a lot for 165. Exactly. So like I can probably get 15 to 20 pounds over. And if I can gain another 10 pounds in body weight, like uh, in training, you know, what's that going to do for my bench? Oh, <laughs> you're going to look like a, like a walking bushel of grapes. <laughs> you put on another 10, 10 pounds of lean mass. <laughs> did, did you get a lot of attention or a lot of like feedback from that 501? Cause that was a grinder that the crowd was going nuts for. Uh, honestly, everybody except Angelo really just focused on the deadlift. That's everybody nuts. just completely overlooked the bench except Angelo. <laughs> that being, being, I was front row for that. Cause, cause I know you a little bit and watching, I mean, it wasn't the grinder of the century, but you know, it slowed down and, and you fought through it. Um, but the crowd went insane because the crowd, I think, understood the magnitude of 501 at 181 at the time. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, only like four or five people have done that at 181. Right. Um, it's definitely something I've been chasing for a while now. I attempted it at the Kern, and then I attempted it twice at the showdown in September and missed it all three times. So, like, fourth time's the charm this time around. Third competition in a row. Like, yeah. Sounds like subpar um, preps are what you need. I Yeah, I know, right? And I even <laughs> made jokes going into it. I'm like, this is the shittiest prep I've had in like a year and a half and watch it be the meat that I show up at. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, man. That's great. It's, it's so typical of people to um, like, if you're considered a specialist in one of the lifts, even if you're like phenomenal at the other lifts, people always focus on that one. And I think it's especially biased towards deadlift because that's what like ultimately determines the, the positioning in a meet, you know? So I remember throughout Steffi's career, people would always be like, oh, deadlift specialist. She's like one of the best deadlifters. And I'd always be like, she's, you know, she literally squats as much as she deadlifts, yeah. you know? And, but she would ne she never really got any sort of like big recognition for the squat and, uh, I don't know, I'm biased because squat is my favorite thing, but I always thought that was the coolest part of what she did. Um, but um, I had a point to that. Oh, and so, like, oh, you see it with like Jamal too. Like Jamal yeah. is across the board, squat, bench, and deadlift are all great, but just because he's in that like thousand yeah. range for deadlift, like no one's, ta no one's talking about his bench or his squat. Yeah, right. everybody just fixates on whichever one is better, even if it's only slightly. And I'm like, most of us play this for the total, you know, yeah. like we're in this to be a total specialist, not a single lift specialist because you it's very rare that you can win a competition by being a single lift specialist. Yeah. Yeah. Gone are the days where you could just have a huge deadlift and everybody's like hundreds of pounds ahead of you and squat and bench and then you just whoop, make it up. Yeah. You know, that used to be the case yeah. a lot of the time. But now I think powerlifting has gotten so much more popular. And you're getting a lot more quality athletes, people who came from, you know, college sports or, or who just had a really good aptitude for it and went into it because it's getting so much more exposure that you're not really seeing those just like random one lift outliers taking it anymore. Right. Yeah. I and mean, what's funny is that's actually how I started. I, I started the sport playing the subtitle game. Uh, my squad right. was like top five of the competitions I would go to and my, I'd out bench everybody by hundred pounds. So I was wow. the last person to go on bench, but I was the second opener on deadlift. <laughs> so like I started the flight. <laughs> Times have changed. But yeah. Oh yeah. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, when you're beating people by a hundred pounds in bench press, like normally people are like, ah, if you have a great bench, it doesn't help that much because it impacts the total the least, but it's like, that's a big, hundred pounds is a big deficit yeah. to overcome to try to come back and deadlift. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was benching 400 pounds in a bench shirt when I was 16, 17, wow. <laughs> but I was only deadlifting 500 pounds conventional. And like my competition was in that 550 to 600 pound range. Wow. So it was a real crap shoot. And like the meat really doesn't start until deadlifts do. Right. Because that's when games are being played. 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Strategy and everything. I mean, and that's part of why I think people uh, like it. You know, it's like you said, strategy comes into play. Also, um, like obviously the placing and then just people going for crazy numbers. It moves fast pace. You don't have to just rack heights. So it's like one guy lifts, gets off, the next guy lifts. It's just like, I don't know. It's definitely the most fun thing to watch in a meet, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and then like being a lifter on the platform, like for deadlifts, um, your adrenaline's going. You might hit a twenty kilo PR because your adrenaline's going. Your uh-huh. height, like you're warmed up from squats. Like yeah. that's the time to try one of those hail marys, and maybe maybe something spectacular will actually happen. Yeah, <laughs> as lo- yeah, as long as you like have managed your energy well throughout the day. And you didn't burn it all out, but at your level, I'm sure that you've got that pretty pretty well handled. I always I always find myself like falling asleep at the beginning of bench, though. I, it really takes a lot for me to to like get up for that opener. It, it always feels like the heaviest lift of the day, my bench opener, and then and then <laughs> I swear, and then then as if someone gives me a slap or like you know I take some uh, take a sniff of ammonia, I'm like okay maybe I'm all back, right, I'm I'm back awake now. now. It's easy to get hyped for squat because. It can just squish you. <laughs> I almost have to get hyped. <laughs> yeah. Will. Yeah. It's the most uncomfortable one, and then you deadlift. Obviously, you're like everything's on the line for deadlift. Bench. I'm just like, I don't know. I hope it goes okay. I, I, I yeah. Love bench, it. bench is the break. It's yeah. The breather. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that Hayden brought that up because the longest pause command I've ever had in my life was my bench opener when Hayden was head judge. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for making it really hard, dude. That was like two years ago. You yeah, know, that too, that yeah. down. <laughs> That's good though. I just, you know, when you're, when you have a live stream and you're one of the like bigger meets on the, the circuit, it's like people are so critical of everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, especially since you were with hybrid, I didn't want people being like, oh, he's giving these hybrid guys like quick yeah. commands. So I'm like, it made you suffer a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we can keep talking about Chesco's squat in private too. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that one, I, that was legit. I thought someone was giving one of our guys like that. Were you one of them? I, I gave Chesco red lights. <laughs> for <death>. Wow. <laughs> I, I was literally sitting at the side at hip crease of one of our guys telling him when to go up because he moves so slow and squat. I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Francesco, but he moves so slow that you literally have the time once he hits the hole, like to just be like, okay, go up now. <laughs> my, my, count, my counterpoint to all of that was that he went deeper the next time. So he did. Well, he could always like, I mean, he could always go deeper. He, right. he does struggle with the depth, but I was like, I was annoyed at Brandon on that one. Cause he red lighted him on the third one too. And oh. I was like, come on, that one was even deeper. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I gave it to him after. Cause it but was I, I heard uh, Brandon got removed in the ghost meet <coughs> as one of the judges for giving too many red lights. Red lighting everybody. <laughs> Yeah, Literally apparently, because that girl that, that won was going to bomb out on squat, and apparently someone from WRPF was like, you, get out of yeah, here. Right. <laughs> you're, you're making all the good people bomb out. That's, that was tomorrow, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she missed her first two squats on depth. I remember that. And uh, then they yanked Brandon and stuck someone else in. And I think the other side judge actually still gave her a red. I could be wrong, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> but at least, you know, front judge is not really going to call you on depth. And then... They put in someone who, who didn't want to get in trouble. I'm sure. <laughs> I do appreciate that about like at least the WRPF. I think it's a rule that like the head judge can't call for deaths. Yeah, well, I mean, and cool. they shouldn't, right? Like it's a it's a really terrible angle. It's like you're just looking at the front of people's quads, and everybody looks like they're squatting high from that position. So, yeah, yeah, you can't actually see the hip crease and the knee joint next to each other. Right. Yeah. So like. Yeah, and well, and not only that, like some people have one hip that's higher than the other. Like that's super common. And for I have sure. clients that I'm like, just, just shoot for two white lights, man. Like we got to work with what we've got. Yeah. Yeah. And so if the head judge is just feeling like he wants to be an ass that day and is throwing reds, well, now my lifter that squats high on one side and good on the other is going to be screwed. Yeah. 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 That's tough. Is that, is that a rule in USPA as well? I'm not sure. I don't think that's a rule, but it uh-huh. does say that the benefit of the doubt is given to the Goes lifter. To for sure. So I, I do appreciate that. And my interpretation of that personally is if you have to make me, if I think about, if I have to think about it, it's a white line. Yeah, that's, 
Exactly. When I was going into judging <clears throat> Showdown 3, um, Carlos Reyes uh, gave me that advice. He said, if you have to think about it for more than a second or two, it goes to the lifter. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's not something I'm really used to being a USATL IPF lifter for so long. <laughs> if they had to think about it, it's a red light. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. I if mean, your but, butt cheeks don't touch the floor, it's basically a red light there. If your bench uh, pause is yeah. five minutes long, it's, it's not good enough. <laughs> well, the one I gave you um, would have counted. Oh, yeah, in the USAPL, that would have been legit. <laughs> you could have made coffee during that bench pause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so let's talk about that deadlift uh, that you were bringing up earlier. The, I think it was your opener. Was that the, So let me just give you the, the crowd perspective, crowd being me. Um, I said to whoever's next to me, Candace or somebody, I said, I think the spotter touched it. Because you, I saw you look back and you looked angry, understandably. Um, what I heard later was different, but I'll let you tell it. So, um, so I'm setting up. Everybody that, that has watched me deadlift at this point knows I have a really long deadlift setup. So I've really only got time to set up once. <laughs> right. And so I'm setting up. I look down. And when I look down the spotter's foot is like between my legs. Never in my life have I seen the foot of the back spotter and it just like instantly snapped me out of my zone. Yeah. Oof. And I hesitated for a second and I thought about telling him to back up a little bit, but I was very conscious of the time and I'm like, mm. I don't have time right. to tell him that. So I just keep going, lost my balance. And then immediately afterwards, I got a little snippy and, and told him to back off. But we, we talked after the fact. I totally yeah. appreciate you trying to do your job, you know, but back I, up a little bit. I had dinner with him that night. And he was he was totally cool about it. He understood. Who was the back spot? Um, it was, oh, man, I know it was 80 Blake on Instagram. He's one of Garrett's guys. Super nice guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, super nice guy. Guy with the amazing hair. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could see why he'd want to get in, like, close that way, but I also... Like, I don't know, I don't want to look between my legs and see someone's yeah. foot. It's like, is your knee going to go up my butt when I when I lower to, like, pull off the floor? When I wedge, yeah. Yeah. I, like, the yeah. way I've heard it told by outsiders that aren't you is that your deadlift setup is so technical that the, the, the margin for error is almost nil. It, yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, I mean, I've gotten a little bit better about it in the past six months or so. I mean, obviously, I... I held on to three deadlifts in the competition twice now. <laughs> I didn't get all the deadlifts, but I held on to all of them. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been working on grip? Is... Yeah. Um, and what well, do you do for that? Because that's such a common thing now. Uh, everybody, like, you know, once you get to a certain point, you guys are all strong. You, there's a bo the bottleneck becomes just how much you can hang on to. Really, you see, I mean, you see it with Jamal, and you see it with even with Hack and some other guys. Yeah. Um, well, for me personally, there were a couple of factors that played into it. So my left thumb is like a little more than an eighth of an inch shorter than my right one. Wow. So historically, if my skin doesn't tear, I drop the bar with my left hand, which coincidentally is also my dominant hand. Go figure. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just the hand that the grip slips with. Um, and then... I, it's really hard to work around that. There's only so much I can do, but I changed my diet up and I've mentioned this previously. Um, and I, I now do a predominantly animal based diet. Um, and so meat and fruit and honey, it's pretty much exclusively what I eat. Wow. And nice. a lot of the other things that I was eating were causing an inflammatory response in my hands. Right. And I, I have a family history of just kind of puffy fingers. Like my dad has it. My mom has it. Like most of the men in my family, it's a genetic thing very clearly. But as soon as I switched to, or about a month after switching to the animal based diet, I went down like a one to two ring sizes. Oh, wow. So my, one to two ring so sizes. My, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Like, I don't know if you can see, but like there's literally a oh, gap yeah, yeah, in wow. my ring. And so... As soon as my hands got smaller, I literally stopped dropping bars. Wow. And that's... so the entire prep 
for the hybrid, I didn't drop a single deadlift and I didn't lose my balance on a single deadlift. And I was like, oh my God, it was that simple. Just don't eat like sh crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, hey, sit, I mean, look, it took you so many years of, of trying to figure it out before you got to it. You know, so just because something simple, simple doesn't mean it's easy to, to figure out or easy to, uh, you know, implement. So yeah, it, no, good for definitely. you for looking for the solutions everywhere. Well, and, and grip was always something that really upset me that was a factor on my deadlift because whenever I pulled mixed grip and lifting in the USAPL and IPF, grip was my strong suit. I was never, I've never in my life did I drop a bar on deadlift until I switched to the untested side, started pulling hook grip on a deadlift bar. Never dropped a bar in comp. Right. Well, why do you think that is? Just lifting more uh, now? Um, you know, it could be a factor of th like a many, many of things like one learning how to do hook grip. That's, that's obviously one of them. Um, yes, the deadlift bar is a little smaller, but it just moves differently. It fits in your hand differently. You know, I, I think a lot of it just kind of came down to learning how to actually get everything set. And now that I have sh the actual strength of my grip is kind of back to where I expect it to be. Okay. You know, I genuinely think as long as I can set it correctly after a nice training cycle, I think I can pull 900 pounds and hold on to it. Wow. Yeah, it's funny how you say that uh, it was just sort of like learning the equipment too and learning how to pull hook grip on the deadlift bar. So I think people have um, like a misunderstanding when it comes to that. It's like, sure, the deadlift bar. Uh, you know, favor certain styles of pulling, but you see it all the time when IPF people, you know, they'll go do, they'll go do, go do worlds and they're like, all right, I'm going to do a YOLO lift with like uh, bumpers and a deadlift bar. And it's like some, t some people who it favors will lift more and some people like lift less and they're like, oh, oops, <laughs> there goes the deadlift bar theory. But I think that's, that's the same with a lot of things. Like, you know, you assume that when you, when you put on uh, wraps, you're going to squat more. But there's, you have to change the style that you use yep. to squat, right? The cadence of your squat might change. And also just the, they're like, there's a lot of skill acquisition that you just get from repetition. Like I'm sure, you know, right? If you ever go a long period of time without using wraps, the first like couple of weeks don't necessarily like feel right until you get that, you know, that rhythm, that timing is so different. Yep. You gotta, you gotta remind your body what it is that you're doing. Um, and that's one of the reasons why so normally whenever I get in wraps, I just do like one eight to 10 week prep and wraps and go into the meet. This time around, I'm actually here in the next month or so, once things settle down with our gym, I'm gonna do like a four or six week wrap cycle just to remind myself how to do it, deload, and then actually start my meat prep. <laughs> so that I'm not learning how to do it in the midst of a meat prep. Yeah, good call. I think that's smart. Jeremy Hamilton, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember him or if he was before your, your time in the sport, but um, he was the guy that, he's the Canadian that uh, sort of came out of nowhere and beat Dan Green at one of the boss of bosses way back. Oh, wow. Um, but he was saying basically exactly what you said. I was like a bunch of weeks out from the meet and he's like, you're not going to try to just like do the last bit of your prep in, in the wraps, right? And I was like, that's what I had always done at the time when I was, when I was there. And I was like, yeah, like, what do you mean? I don't want to have to be like one wearing wraps way out because that's so annoying to like train for a long <laughs> period of time. It just bugs your biceps and all that stuff. Right. So it's, if you're wrapping for yourself, um, but he just changed my mind on it. And then it was nice cause I didn't have to like reacquire the skill going into the meet. You know, I was used to it. I was doing it like once or twice a week. And then just when I got closer to the meet, that's when I you know, started using it for all of my heavy sessions. Um, but then I had my two best squat meets after that because I was, I was used to it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's really uh, an important thing. And I think the same goes for like anything, even using a squat bar is different than using a, a regular bar. You know? and yeah. Uh, something I've noticed about the squat bar is like, it takes more weight to make it bend, but once it starts bending, I feel like it bends significantly more than a power bar. Mm 
Mm. Yeah, um, well, especially if you're talking about like the uh, the Alico Power Bar has more tinsel strength than the like a Texas Squat Bar by a fair amount, I believe. Oh yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I I have one Alico Bar at the gym, and I absolutely love it. I'll actually squat on it from time to time just because I like how it feels on my back. <laughs> yeah, well, even, even just though I almost. The people don't realize just even the circumference of the squat bar, it just being that much thicker changes things as well. Like even if it's minute and it changes the, your your torso angle just by a few millimeters, it's like you, now you're moving yeah. in a different, you know, in a way that you're not used to if you've only ever trained on a, on a regular bar. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and that brings into something that I've recently started saying, um, strength is a skill. Like powerlifting is a skill, just like any other sport. You have to practice and learn how to do these things with all of your competition equipment or else you're setting yourself up for failure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I remember, uh, I'm pretty sure the first time, I think the first time Steffi did wraps and the first time she did a bench shirt, she lifted way less than she could do just completely raw. She was like, this makes no sense. <laughs> but obviously being being how she is she figured it out and became really really good at it well never the bench shirt actually she just ended up saying screw the bench shirt she was gonna do um uh, w uh that west side documentary wanted her to do a meet um, and like follow her basically as one of the people for it yep. to prepare to prepare for a uh an equipped yep. uh competition at the arnold and uh they sent her a bench shirt, like all the stuff, like squat suit, everything that she would have needed. And uh, she did one session in the bench shirt and I was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and just bailed on the whole thing. <laughs> Didn't Mark Bell Honestly, try to show her how to do it? Yeah, at super so. training. But I, I don't think Mark actually had a, a bench shirt that was small enough for her. Oh, it was like his shirt or something. So she was, yeah, it wasn't, it, it wasn't the same thing. It was just like this giant red Inzer one. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think. Well, well, there's the problem right there. I mean, <laughs> Enzer bench shirts are not not the bench shirts you want to be using. So yes, you we know, gotta, we gotta, <laughs> what's the what's the the, the like the goat bench shirt? Uh, the Titan Super Katana, hands down. Okay. I, I think ninety five percent of people in the equipped world will agree. Even the multi ply lifters still use the single ply super katana because it is the best shirt on the market what what's that new one that seemingly allows you to press like 400 pounds more uh so recently they started incorporating like you know what the bench daddy is yes specifically the bench daddy made by mike womack yep no i don't know what is that uh so it's like a, a slingshot kind of um, but it's, it's just built a little differently and they essentially started making that with a shirt sewn to it oh, and it's okay. now legal in comps and they have multiply versions of it and it's so much u more user friendly. Like there's really no margin for error. Yeah. And so it's really easy to get just a thicker, more heavy duty material, make it double ply and bench double your bench press. You know, I, I just watched a video of Jimmy Cobb bench like 1,300 pounds in that shirt. Wow. Yeah, girl. Which absolutely blows my mind. A woman at my old gym, she just set the heaviest bench press by, by a woman in that shirt. It's in the 600s. So. That's, which is absolutely absurd. Yeah. But at the same time, for me, I'm like, it's almost cheating. <laughs> and like, that's where I draw my line. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Now, don't get me wrong. If I ever get back in a bench shirt, if it's allowed in comp, I, I, I'll probably try it out. You know. Well, yeah. Why not? Um, yeah. If it's allowed, I, I, like I, I've always liked to push the limits of the rule book. So whatever it'll allow me to do, I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Do you have any desire to do equipped lifting again? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so something that I've been eyeballing for quite some time now is you know everyone thought it was really cool when john hack held three all-time world record totals across three weight classes well my goal is to hold it across three divisions oh that's cool so raw classic raw and equipped nice wow okay. but the way things are going i might actually be able to surpass that equipped total in wraps oh wow really but you have to, you like, have to do it equipped though for it to count as the equipped record though right 
Well, I would have to, at the very least, do it at an equipped meet. I could still do it in just wraps, you know, for the clout, I guess. Wow. But I really want to get in a bench shirt. <laughs> that would be nuts to walk in just with wraps yeah. and beat everybody that's equipped. That would be cool because like you were saying, all the different equipment requires different skills that you have to develop. So it is, I think that's probably the biggest testament to a lifter is being able to prove that you're not just strong raw, but you also have the ability to, to adapt to these different uh, tools that require certain skills. And it is super different. Like even squatting with wraps versus squatting with wraps in a suit is different. You know, like, Oh, all absolutely. Really like different. you, that's, that's actually uh, what I attribute. Like it, it took me a couple months to really figure out how to use wraps because I'm used to being able to sit my hips back a little bit into the suit with the wraps oh, okay. as opposed to relying on the wraps as my, primary point of tension so not being able to push my hips back really freaked me out <laughs> did you just feel like you didn't have any, like stability there yeah I, I didn't feel like I had support because I'm used to getting 100 pounds out of my suit and maybe 50 pounds out of my wraps not 100 pounds out of my wraps yeah okay yeah, it really changes the style, right? It forces you to really drive your knees over your toes. It sort of like, it really, um, it, it really makes it more beneficial to hit the hole hard if you want to spring, you know, out of the yeah. ramps, like all those things. So that is pretty cool. Do you have any idea when you want to do that? What I, what I'll probably end up doing, um, I've got a few goals that I want to hit raw and classic raw first. And then I might just take like a year or two off of lifting raw and classic or competing raw and classic raw and actually spend a good year learning how to reuse a bench shirt in a squat suit and, you know, just do something nutty like 23, 2400 total. Wow. I like how you corrected to say time off competing because when you compete equipped, you're still training raw and then you just have to do all the extra equipped shit. So it's extra hard. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. And even I didn't really until I was actually watching the West Side documentary. And one of the guys was like, I don't know what all these guys are talking about when they're trying to boost like competing raw. Like lifting raw is easy. I do that every day. I just also yep. have to lift equipped. <laughs> <laughs> but Yeah, and it it makes you such a better raw lifter too, because as you were saying, like there's so many other technical things about it. You have to be smart. Right. You know, I knew a guy in college that like, he was a, he was a terrible raw lifter. I mean, he didn't have, he had bad mechanics. At like, I mean, we're talking like a 12, 1300 pound total as a 205. Oh, okay. You know, but he could total 2K in the suit. Wow. And he just, he was smart. He knew how it worked and he knew how to manipulate the suits to give him what he wanted. Wow, that's crazy. That is crazy. That's nuts. Two, 2K total is a, a big total regardless of how you achieve it, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of buddies that are really ecstatic about doing it in multiply. So, you know, that's still the, the barrier, like that 2K. Um, speaking about equipment, what do you think about these ins or knee sleeves that everyone's freaking out about right now? Oh, you know, I actually tried a pair on for the first time Sunday. A client of mine had them and they were too big for her. And she was like, hey, you, what, you, you want to try them? And I'm like, yeah, I want to try them. <laughs> so, and just, so just for everybody listening, ins are released these knee sleeves and um, it's, it's unclear what happened because it's either one of these two things but basically somebody cut them open and it looks like they're made out of rubber on the inside instead of neoprene mm -hmm. so now there's like there's two like possible arguments the first one is did they get a neoprene knee sleeve passed and then just put a rubber knee sleeve into production and which would have been super sneaky yep. or is this like dense rubber that everyone's freaking out about just like a better quality type of neoprene i guess is though like those are the two arguments and was it actually just approved and now is rightfully you know right well whatever now the uspa is reviewing it and i'm sure the other federations are going to so sorry to interrupt yeah. your story but i just want oh, people good. to have context um 
So I, the first thing I noticed when I picked them up was the density. Oh my God. Like they're probably twice as dense as my SPDs. Could, could you get them on by yourself? I, I'll give you context after. Yes, oh, I, wow. I was able to get them on by myself. I could not get them off by oh, myself. Oh, okay, yeah. Because <laughs> I've had to help Kevin Oak out of his every single time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my wife, my client, and me all put our hands on this knee sleeve to get it off of my leg. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to cut off my client's knee sleeve from my <laughs> leg. <laughs> oh, no. O Oak has taken a putting uh, a, a strap two straps through and then we loop it and he pushes and I have to pull it. It's, it's, he just it's leaves it in though when he squats yeah. too, right? Yeah. The straps, oh, yeah. if you see his squat videos, there's just straps hanging out the, of this. Because the straps are more for getting them off than getting them on. Yeah. You know, I actually noticed that. I saw him dangling and I was like, is that a new knee sleeve? Or no, no. I, I, like, I analyzed it. I'm like, oh, this <laughs> to, is to get him off. <laughs> the, the first time when he did a 782 triple, uh, Simon and I both had to work to get them off and then the next time he showed up with the straps, and now it's only a two-person job, not a three-person job. So, <laughs> yeah, you guys, you guys are gonna be like a little uh, NASCAR pit crew. In That's there. pretty much what it is. By the end of it. <laughs> All right. So I mean, back it, to <laughs> it takes a village, right? <laughs> yeah. So back to your story. Oh, that was that was the end of my knee sleep story. Well, did, oh. so how did they? How did they feel? Do you yeah. feel like? Oh, I. It, it feels like a knee wrap. It feels yeah. like a loose knee wrap. Um. Mm -hmm. I, I like them personally. <laughs> and so the WRPF has already said it fits in the confines of our rule book regardless. So, you know, I'll probably end up investing in a pair for my WRPF sleeve mates. Well, you know what's uh, interesting about that is if USPA and, I, and IPF reject it and WRPF doesn't, that's, I think, not going to be good for WRPF because that'll further, like, sort of the whole you know, Sub wild west culture that people like to associate with uh, that federation, you know, mm. the lawless culture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I've kind of realized people are going to go where the money is going to go. Yeah, for sure. You know, and then also open powerlifting isn't going to discriminate. And so I, I don't know if it's going to have too much of a negative effect it, in my mind i was like you know it might have a positive effect for the federation by allowing them yeah maybe. because it's like man i can squat an extra 30 pounds in these knee sleeves and they'll allow me to do it and open powerlifting doesn't discriminate yeah for sure oh i you do know? whatever's allowed to, to lift the most for sure i just as long as it doesn't create another category i don't want to see raw classic raw and raw with ins or knee sleeves <laughs> <laughs> raw with ergos or whatever it's called well, and then you've got a RPS that groups raw um, sleeves and wraps in the same division, right. which I, I'm really not a fan of. Yeah. That, that was RPS, you said? Yeah. That so it's, pounds it's, you can wear socks during deadlifts, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, naked knees at a meet, I'm like, nah, I'm about that. <laughs> There, yeah, I, I competed in a federation that was like that. It was called, um, I think it was WPC maybe or WPS. Yeah. But I did this competition in Portugal, uh, and there was bare knees, which it like was the raw category, mm -hmm. and I competed only raw at the time. So I was wearing bare knees, and they were so strict about um, like your torso angle, like your hips being locked out at the bottom at the to start. And at the bottom, there were like 15 people who just bombed out because they couldn't, their hips couldn't extend enough in the low bar position to get a start command. What? Yeah, it was insane. That's not... It was insane. Yeah, that's, that's bizarre. Excessive. I've never heard of that. Most of the, actually every rule book I've ever read only talks about the knees. They don't care what your hips do. As long as you start and finish in the same place, it doesn't matter. I know, it's super weird. They're strict on a bunch of different things, but I know that Federation is like European based, I think. I don't know, what, I don't even know what the other one is, like where I had to compete to qualify for that, but. Yeah. Was it an APF meet? Because I think WPC is the governing body. Um, I, the one that I did was in uh, Canada. Um, so I, can't, okay. I, I think it was maybe CPF, I don't know. 
some <laughs> it's been a, it was a long time ago so i don't know it was right at the beginning of my my powerlifting career i think it was like that one was like the second meet i ever did at that time i did my buddy francesco he would just enter meets and be like hey do you want to do this one with me and i was like sure and i ended up doing like 10 meets a year <laughs> <laughs> or 19 yeah uh no yeah i would have been like yeah maybe 20 or 21 at the time insane and i had just switched to powerlifting because i got injured in uh olympic weightlifting so i was like i was just trying to get as much experience as i could starting a little bit later um but yeah obviously that's not the best for progress <laughs> 10 minutes a year <laughs> yeah so no, blake you just I mean, got, it sounds opened like a, a gym now do what you just opened a gym right yeah today is actually our first day open to the public Wow, damn, congrats. It's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad we can help you uh, get the news out. What's, what's the gym called? Primal Strength and Performance. Okay, cool. And what, uh, what was the process like? I'm always interested to hear because, uh, you know, we've gone through the process and we had to do everything. Like, well, when we opened our first gym, Steffi and I were just kids, basically. We didn't have any idea what we were doing. Second one, we still didn't know what we were doing, but we had a little bit better idea. And I, you know, it's like you run into so many things that are unexpected that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have anticipated. So yeah, tell us about oh. it. Oh yeah. Um, so it's been about three months in the making, at least from the time we got the keys to the time we've, we got the space ready to be used. Um, my wife and I have done pretty much everything by hand. Our, our landlord didn't give us any. Wow. Uh, it's called TI, Tenant Improvement Allowance, to work with, to, to do renovations. So we had to cheap out. <laughs> I, uh, I did all the rubber flooring myself. Took me three days to lay rubber flooring. Oh, that's the biggest bitch of the whole thing. <laughs> it doesn't matter how strong you are. Moving a rubber sheet is a, is a humbling experience. <laughs> it really, really is. I mean, ours were only four feet wide, 25 feet long, and each one ranged from like 160 to 180 pounds. And I'm like <laughs> trying to strongman carry these things across the room mm -hmm. by myself. Carrying those things is like trying to carry a child while they're trying to squiggle out of your arms. Yeah. Like yeah, there's just no really, good really way to, to hold that thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. And cutting it too. Oh my God, I have... Like five new scars from the the blade. Just it, it got dull. Jumped the rubber and stabbed myself. Oh my god! <laughs> I know you have to refresh that blade like every sheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you really do. Um, but yeah, we, my wife and I, we saved up money um, for the past couple of years. We had enough for a down payment on a loan. We got an SBA loan. Um, and just kind of went from there. It took us the better part of a year to actually find a space that would work for everything. Yeah, so, that's tough. Because you don't want to settle it, for something that kind of fits. You'll always regret that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we started looking at like warehouse spaces. They're a little cheaper. Um, and then we ended up deciding on a retail space and a pretty prime location. Mm, cool. Much more expensive, but it's going to be worth it in the long run just because of the amount of traffic we're going to be able to get and we have air conditioning people love their air conditioning oh yeah <laughs> that's a huge bonus in a powerlifting gym or even any sort of niche gym crossfit gyms too it's crazy yeah. in florida the crossfit gyms like half of them don't have ac you walk in there they're like we're gonna do our warm-up i'm like that was walking in <laughs> there's, there's, yeah i'm sweating already <laughs> there's a crossfit gym across from my building you know Crossway my window. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just driving by, it's 90 degrees with pure humidity. You're drinking the air. Those idiots have the door open. It's just like, <laughs> all right, have fun yeah. with that. But they don't yeah, care because yeah. in CrossFit, they all just want to lift without their shirt on. Because they all just want to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. that, I, was, I was just thinking about the humidity over there. It's so much worse. <laughs> I, when I first started powerlifting, I was lifting out of a CrossFit gym that didn't have AC. And it, there would be days where there was literally no amount of chalk that was enough to like make you able to hold onto the bar because they would just be wet. As soon as I would close my hand, I would just have like the chalk would just turn to this like liquid putty solution. <laughs> <laughs> 
it was not good. That's insane. Yeah, that's not good for deadlifting. That's yeah, sure. I found not out I, if you if I wore long sleeve shirts, then it, it was okay because the sweat didn't like uh, drip down my forearms. Uh, so that's a little hack for anybody listening or lifting in. Well, human, but then you but, had to wear a long sleeve shirt when it's ninety. Degrees. Yeah, so then you're you're suffering. <laughs> yeah, this but one way or sad. another you lose, but at least you can <laughs> you can hold on to the bar that way. <laughs> so where in San Antonio are you? Um, it's north central san antonio so okay. the higher end area thankfully okay nice. we can't afford to live in the higher end area but we made the business work <laughs> <laughs> well it's good to have a business in a higher end area where people can afford those luxury things like going to a specialty gym you know it's like yeah otherwise you you can be confined to sort of uh a place that's that's only gonna be good for people who want like ten dollar gym memberships to LA Fitness or whatever. And it's impossible to compete with the prices of those right. those big box yeah. gyms. Yeah, but and well, and you know, our goal was to we actually modeled um, a lot of things after hybrid. You know, I, I really liked. Oh, I, wow. I visited hybrid a few years ago, um, and I really liked that there were no pound plates inside. It was exclusively kilo plates. And I'm like, that's the goal. Like, that's the dream. Um, Very cool. Regardless of who you are, having calibrated plates is going to be a benefit because those 45 pound plates are not 45 pounds. No. Way out. They're yeah. not even close. It's funny. Uh, <laughs> there, there's a, a gym called Fortis in Canada that's notorious for their pound plates being wildly off. So they, uh, they've, written the individual weights like weighed them all out and, and written them down so you can try to find ones that like match close enough but it's like they're all heavy so you know if they're they're like two to four pounds heavy so you know by the end if you have eight plates on that bar it's like you're lifting a lot of extra shit you're not getting credit for <laughs> that's all yeah. kinds of extra math <laughs> like i'm yeah, trying yeah. to find the 44.7 that matches the 44.7 but it's like what like yeah that's that's torture well, so I, I've actually done a little research. I'm like, why does this happen? Like, it doesn't make sense. So out of the factory, they have a 3% variance up or down. Right. But then on top of that, they oxidize. So the older the plates are, the heavier they're going to be because when they oxidize and rust on the inside, it wow. adds weight and they warp. Right. Wow. So that's how you end up with 55 pound, 45 pound plates. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy and three percent doesn't sound like a lot but it is and again especially when you're talking about you know if you're lifting over 800 pounds in a deadlift like that's a lot of yeah. variance and that also means you could accidentally have th all your plates on one side be three percent heavier and all the plates on the other side right. be three percent lower you have no idea yep so exactly that's that is the beauty of calibrated plates because i i can't remember exactly but the variance on them is like a fraction it's of a like a gram or something it's a gram they're a gram, calibrated to so. the yeah. gram yeah i always heard that pound plates were allowed to be like two pounds in either direction whereas like the kilos are a gram or two yeah well yeah. i think and that's i don't think they really regulate it like you they don't need some governing body to sign off on the weight of their plates right so a company so one company could have a five pound variance. Yeah. So one company could have a one pound variance for all you know. Yep. You know, it's yep. like obviously it's not it's in their interest to have some level of quality control, but yeah, I mean that hasn't stopped people from making shitty products right. ever. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell you from firsthand experience the when when drop ins come to hybrid, like it's it's not always the equipment, it's the all the kilo plates. That's where people's eyes go and they're like, Holy shit. Like they see all the reds and they're like they, it's mind blowing. So well, even the blues, I mean, it's really cool to have calibrated 20 kilo plates. Like, yeah, they're not 45s and it's about a pound less, but that's really easy to do the math. Okay. I've got eight plates on the bar, subtract six, 16 pounds. Right. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's super easy. I also like, so, uh, I like the blue plates for bench press because I know you don't have this problem because you bench 500 pounds. But for me, when I do bench press, if I have like 400 pounds on the bar and I'm using the reds, I'm like, this looks, looks like if someone who doesn't know about powerlifting comes in here, it looks like I'm just lifting <laughs> peanut weights, you know? So I like to put the, the blues on, get get four on the bar. I can feel, I, I, can, I can get behind that. Well, and then the warm ups are a little different too. True, you because know, yeah. Like, My only problem with, the, with, with that, with the blues, and I did a whole bench cycle with just blues last time. But it's when you get four plates and you get the person who doesn't know kilo plates. Like, oh, you just bench four or five and you got to tell them, no, it's 397. 
<laughs> yeah, like, oh. I, I, I don't think I ever just put 180 on the bar. It at least has to be uh, 180, two and a half, or whatever the whatever makes it four. Right. <laughs> yeah. That well, and that's why I never attempted the like 496 on the platform. It's always going to be that 501. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, for sure. That 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 little that one makes the the load very unesthetic. But the day you, you do it. that, that 496 is going to look like an opener, and you're just. But it's your third, and you're going to be like, I should have done the 501. So. I yep. Might as well yep, and it. that's why I just went for it every single time. <laughs> and you find yeah. I was like, because it's going to be there one of these days, and I'm going to be so pissed at myself for attempting 496. <laughs> I know. And pe people think it doesn't make a difference, that extra one pound, but they forget it's not the one pound, it's the 500 before that one <laughs> that makes that last one extremely difficult, right? Yeah. 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 When so like even maxes. if I was strong enough to hit 501, and you know, did 496 on the second and then did a two and a half kilo jump. Well, that 496 just drained me. Yeah, yeah yep. for sure. Absolutely. So do you take big bench jumps normally? Yeah, uh, I actually do one red, two red, and then go straight to three red from there. Wow. And then I'll do smaller jumps. Yeah, well, that's pretty big, 50 kilo jumps. Yeah. I'll but I mean, otherwise he's, I, gonna, he's gonna be in there all day if he has to keep yeah. loading the... the <laughs> change the place. I, I had to work up to that. It wasn't something that I just decided to start doing. Like I had to actually train it to, to be comfortable making that jump because I used to go, you know, two reds, 275. And then I would do like 363, you know, which is still a 40 kilo jump, still substantial. But the very first time I made that first, that 50 kilo jump, like it, it almost bit me in the ass because <laughs> <laughs> But if you, you, I mean, you can warmer. adapt to so much, like as a lifter, your body's so adaptive. So I feel like it's really in your benefit to be able to do as few warm up attempts as possible. It's like if you're gonna do, if you're going up to 500 pounds, you wanna be hitting 70, 100, 120, one set. Like, you know, that, that really adds up. And even if it's light, like you said, it's, it's, it's gonna tire you out. Yeah. So it's, yeah. I do the same jumps as you do, but for squat, I'll do, all the way up to 600 I'll go from, or whatever that is, 270 uh, or 275 on the squat bar, I'll do red, 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 red. I think that's, yeah, that, that makes a big difference when you're going for a max. Yeah. And then you have to train yeah. it too, right? You don't want it to be doing little ones and little jumps in training and then go get surprised by a 50 kilo jump in a, in a warm up room. Yeah. Yeah, well, because especially on meet day, a squat aside, like, you really want to only do three, maybe four warmups on meet day because you've already done so much lifting. Right. Yeah. That like you're warm and fatigued. Right. Yeah. So it's like you need less warmups, but if your routine is okay, I normally do seven warmups and you're a mental lifter. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really, it's like some people out. Yeah. There's just all the other factors on meet day, the adrenaline, the nerves, whatever, you know, if you if you yeah. if you know you're in a dead heat with somebody thinking about that, you know, it's just so many extra stressors on meet day. So. Yeah, well, that's such a common question. People are like, "How should I do my jumps on meet day? What should I eat on meet day? What should I eat the day before?" And I'm always like, "Just do everything the exact same way you've been doing it." Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can do is do something for your entire prep and then think you need to do something different in in the meet, and you change it. Like the amount of times I've heard people be like. I've, uh, oh, I had too much sodium and then my hands were bloated and I couldn't hang on to the bar. I'm like, well, do you normally have a ton of sodium? Right. No. So you just winged it on the like most important day or like they'll try a pre-workout they've never had before and then they're dizzy and passing out. It's, you know, <laughs> my favorite, my favorite is always the like, oh, I had a box of donuts on meat day. Do you eat donuts any other time during the year? No, I eat well clean quote unquote. Uh, but then why did you get Dunkin' Donuts before the meat? Like what yeah. possessed yeah. you to do this? <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it practice how you play. Like, yeah. I don't understand why people treat powerlifting different from any other sport. It's the same. Yeah, yeah. It's the exact same. And the, the, the further you get into it, the more you lift, the more you realize that strength is a skill. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Do you, so, sorry. No, you go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to ask you, uh, going back to your gym, is it going to be strictly powerlifting? Is it also going to be bodybuilding with machines, Olympic weightlifting? So we, we do have some machines. Um, I mean, we gotta have some auxiliary equipment. All the machines we have are actually explicitly lower body machines. 
and then we've got a cable stack that was a little delayed. Um, it is, we are geared towards powerlifting. It is a powerlifting training facility, but I'm going to let the, let the equipment kind of talk for itself. If you see the equipment and you want to, you're not a powerlifter, but you want to learn how to use the equipment, come on. Like that's yeah. one of the biggest things that, that I want to do is I want to educate people. Well, it's also, and so it makes it a, a cool position for yourself as well, because that's sort of the, the approach we took when we opened hybrid was we're just going to put all the things in it that support what we like. And in doing that, the goal was to bring in a community of people who like what we like. And then you're in this very yeah. like-minded community who has very similar goals. And it's like, whether you're a power lifter or not, very rarely are you training at hybrid with no strength goals, right? Like right. people exactly. aren't just coming in there to use the treadmill and go home. Like they're, they're there to get stronger, you know? So yeah, I think that's a cool thing. Well, and you know, we were very strategic with our name as well. So one primal, I was like, well, recently I changed my um, Instagram to the deadlifting orangutan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then our whole animal based diet and like it's kind of our lifestyle now. Yeah. And so we had to think of something that kind of fit our lifestyle and also like my personal brand. So there's the primal and then strength and performance, not strength and fitness. Right. That's right. not what this is about. I mean, getting fit is an afterthought of being strong. Right. Agreed. Yeah, I've always called it uh, like the aesthetic components that come from strength training are a byproduct of the strength training. Right. So you have, you can yes. get the benefits from doing it. It's actually not the easiest way to get those those benefits, but uh, you know, for it's very rare to see a guy who benches five hundred or deadlifts over seven hundred who doesn't look like they lift. You know. It, yeah. Exactly. And I'm like, that's the goal. Like, you should. In my opinion, your goal should be to look strong, not look fit. Yeah. But obviously, everybody's goals are different, and everything sure. is goal specific. Right. Uh, my my the gym I had been working out of was heavy metal fitness. You know, so they have, he well, there's heavy metal. You know, they've mm -hmm. got a lot of hardcore dudes. It's a big. Sh it's more of a strongman gym. Mm -hmm. They have a couple, you know, pretty good powerlifters, but it says fitness in the name, and there is a lot of fitness in there which is kind of distracting for the serious athletes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I see that. It's it's like I mean, it just goes back to the same thing I was saying before. The more for your own performance and your own experience, the more you can just have people who are interested in and doing the same things around you, the better, right? Like if yeah. I go into a gym and nobody knows what my maxes are, you know, and I I have something on the bar and nobody's hyping me up because they're not familiar with it or they don't know what a good squat is or what a heavy bench is or this. It's like, it, you know, it's hard for you yourself to get amped up. Yeah. Like, a, like yeah. you could do powerlifting very easily in an LA fitness. All you need is a barbell and plates, but the there's a reason why people don't really do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or, the atmosphere is really important. Yeah. Those are the, like you get the people who are at like an LA fitness or any kind of global gym and they start powerlifting. And then they look around and they realize they're now the strongest person in the gym. And that's when they go find a powerlifting gym so they go be the weakest person again. That's what yeah. I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's no fun being the big fish in a small pond. Right. You know, like who's the, who's left to push you now? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Oh, wait. this reminded me of um, when Steffi was competing in uh, raps. And we used to go to the UM gym sometimes, which is the university gym, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, you've seen all those videos where it's like some girl comes in and she squats like 300 pounds and then everyone's like, oh my God, that's crazy. I wouldn't have expected it. But then you have Steffi in there squatting 500 pounds and people are just like, <laughs> the whole gym would just stop and be like, those are fake or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, they've never seen something like that in their lives. They didn't even think that that's possible. Yeah. And, and actually, technically, it hadn't been possible until she, she did it, so. Yeah, there's also that, that visual separation with Steffi because people don't realize without meeting her how small she really is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah well, yeah. people come into the gym, and that's one of the first things they always say. Yeah. So you see her not compared to anything. She's just she jacked. Looks, so yep. she looks you're like, oh, this woman, this is an Amazonian woman. Like, yeah. she must be nine feet tall. Five feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, not quite that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the strength community in San Antonio like I've only been there once and I was just there to get a tattoo so I didn't get to explore or work out 
Um, do you have a lot of powerlifting gyms or? Isn't Texas Strength based on no. that? Texas Strength Systems, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, Texas Strength Systems and my previous gym, uh, Heavy Metal Fitness, are were pretty much the only two powerlifting gym or gyms with powerlifting equipment in them. Right. Um, TSS is pretty much exclusively powerlifting, kind of how we want to be. Um, and then heavy metal is very diverse. Um, they're more of a strongman gym, but they've got two comp racks, kilo plates, uh, you know, a couple comp bars. But then they have a rig, power racks. Like they really kind of cater to everybody. Um, so, and, and people don't want to go to Texas Strength Systems at times because of the college kid environment. Oh. You know, grown ass men don't want to deal with the college kid BS, right. which I understand. Yeah. I was a part of the college kid BS for six years and I don't want to go back. <laughs> do you, do you Van Wilder, how long were you in school for? <laughs> uh, no, I was only in school for four years. You know, I got my I got my degree and got out, but then I hung around to coach the powerlifting team uh, okay. while my wife was the president. And so, yeah, I kind of stayed involved. And my life revolved around the college kid crap. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, in San Antonio specifically, like there is a big powerlifting market here. Yeah. But they're just really compared to the other big cities in Texas, there's really not any powerlifting gyms like we like we just opened. Yeah, that's awesome. Um you go to Austin, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, like there's 10 powerlifting gyms that are loaded with kilo plates and comp racks, uh, you know, a, a, throw, a stone's throw away. Right. And here, there's two decent ones. Wow. Now Good three, but... Yeah, that's great. Well, you definitely definitely seems like you're filling uh, a niche there. Yeah. There's no shortage of powerlifters who want um, hardcore environments, so... Yeah. Sounds Absolutely. like that's what you're going to deliver. Um, well, that we're the only gym in town that has two monoliths. Uh, yeah, that's, and there's that's so a we, big, we big draw. doubled the amount of monoliths in the city of San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's uh, so. I mean, I don't want to take too much of your time. I think we're coming up on an hour. Um, that was a, that hour flew by, but <laughs> yeah, um, it did. Yeah, why don't you tell everybody again? Just name name your gym, where they can find you. Uh, anything else you want to plug, go for it. Um, this is this is your couple so minutes. <laughs> well, uh, so our gym is uh, Primal Strength SA on Instagram. Um, you can my my Instagram handle is again Deadlifting Orangutan, um, mm-hmm. and we aim to be the premier powerlifting training facility here in San Antonio. Awesome, awesome man. Uh, anyone who's in San Antonio or passing through, make sure you check out that gym. Blake is an awesome dude, awesome lifter, and I'm sure he's got lots of wisdom to share with you. Uh, Blake, thanks so much for your time today. Hope you had a good time, and uh, hopefully it's not the last time we'll have to get you on here again. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Blake. All right, man.